In today's episode, we open up the Gospel of Mark now to chapter 11, verse 27 through 12, verse 17. The chief priests, scribes, and elders challenge Jesus' authority to teach and perform miracles. But Jesus responds with a question about John the Baptist's authority, leaving them unable to answer. He then shares the parable of the tenants, illustrating God's rejection of the Israel's religious leaders. And then the Pharisees and the Herodians try to entrap Jesus with a question about paying taxes. Good morning and blessed Pentecost. Today is Thursday, November 16th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Learn more about their translating and publishing work on their website at lhfmissions.org. Well, my guest this morning to help us finish up Mark chapter 11 and move into chapter 12 is the Reverend Jesse Baker. He's the pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Hardwick, Hardwick, Minnesota. Welcome back to the program, brother. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, exciting to have you on. You know, you live just down the road, so we're able to meet in person, which is always fun. In fact, we just had a winkle yesterday with uh, the other pastors in our circuit, so it's always nice to have guys right in the area to be able to bounce ideas off of. And the text for today really has some really important teachings of Jesus, uh, and some of them are a little, I don't want to say scandalous, but some of them are certainly ones that um, have caused us some problems. So we're going to look into those deeply, especially when it comes to paying taxes and stuff like that. But before we get into any of that, would you please start our time together in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the gifts you provided for us, especially as we look at this text of your Son coming to us and preaching his word. Uh, Allow us to conform to what he has to say, because he's the author and perfecter of our life. Uh, Continue to let us to submit to him and become more like him every day. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, why don't we catch folks up, because before we came to this text— We have um, Jesus, well, he's come into Jerusalem, he curses the fig tree, he cleanses the temple. Kind of what's going on in Jesus' life where, I guess, where we find him in this moment? Yeah, so we're in the Tuesday of Holy Week, and that's important to know in the text because we're going to have some um, people come, the chief priests, who is probably some of the Sanhedrin show up. And we need to remember that they actually aren't at the triumphal entry, that they're off doing something else in the thing I found was these officials are not there. That means they didn't think Jesus was that big of a deal, not that big of a problem to deal with. And now, you know, a couple days later, we see them now coming to Jesus and engaging with him. So this, what, where Sunday and Monday, there's a big enough hubbub of Jesus. They go from, let's leave him alone. He's not our problem to, we need to now go deal with this ourselves. So you can tell, already tell the temperatures come up considerably in two days. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. In fact, the beginning of our text is really just about them catching up with Jesus. And of course, he's done something pretty significant that gets their attention, and that's that cleansing of the temple. Yeah, Uh, You know, from your point of view, I I completely agree. And I hadn't really thought about that because, you know, they, they, he comes into Jerusalem. Yeah, it's a big crowd. People like new things. But then, yeah, once he starts flipping tables and whipping people, <laughs> yeah. they go, hey, wait a minute, maybe we should pay attention to this guy. Yeah, our livelihood's being attacked. This guy's a problem. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, so let's look at, let's just look at our text. We're going to go into 11, uh, starting with verse 27, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as Jesus was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things, or, or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. What, what was the baptism of John, Jesus said, from heaven or from man? Answer me. Well, they discussed it with one another, saying, Well, if we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? because they are afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. And so they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. I got to tell you, you got got to love Jesus the way he handles things. I mean, 
let's be honest. You know, we, we have we talked about this when we talked about the overturning of the tables, but I, I want to point out that Jesus is not always this soft spoken what I like to call a church basement movie, you know, is <laughs> you have Jesus and he's got long hair, blue eyes, and he's just soft spoken. And and I do think Jesus was a gentle person um, in his in his humanity, but Jesus also stood up for what was right. And, and so this is another case where he just t- tells him, basically, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then I'm I, it won't do me any good to explain it to you. But take us through this. What what exactly is is he saying? Yeah. So the big thing, again, is authority, and this is kind of Mark's M.O. a little bit sometimes with these people. Because you got to remember, the first time Jesus does a miracle in Mark, it's an exorcism. And they say, hey, by what authority are you throwing out these demons? So we're kind of coming full circle based on that question to hear. Because it's really an identity problem, essentially, is who the heck are you to say these things? Like, you're working out within the proper channels, how dare you? Like, we are trained, we are better than you, Jesus, essentially, is what they're saying. And you are just running around, going and doing your own thing, and that's not how this works here. So when they're asking about authority, they're not necessarily saying, you know, do you have authority from God? What they're saying, it sounds like, is, you know, who do you think you are? Like, like we we are the ones who have the authority. And I guess I've always sort of thought of this as them saying, you know, do you really have permission from God to do this? But as you and I talk about it, now I'm starting to think, yeah, maybe it's more about do you have permission from us to do these things? Yeah, because we got it from God, from Leviticus Mm -hmm. law and all this tradition. And obviously we're the people God wanted in this position and not you, Jesus. You know, and I think that's something that we struggle with today as we even search for people to go and do the Lord's bidding um, I think the importance of forming men to be effective pastors is uh, is incredibly important, and we must do a very good job. Well, at the same time, I think how many people have we maybe excluded that could have really done a good job for the ministry, but they didn't check all the boxes? I think we have to be careful about that, too. Uh, but he says, I will ask you one question, answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. And then he brings up John the baptizer, and he says, you know, was his baptism from heaven or was it from man? So what he's asking them is basically, if you have this baptizer out in the wilderness and he comes in and he's baptizing people in the Jordan, you didn't give him permission to do that. So tell me, did he get it from heaven then? Which is, of course, the right answer. And I think they know that because they even say, if we say from heaven, why would they even consider saying that if they didn't believe it? I mean, I mean, they would they would not even consider saying from heaven. They would just say, well, we can't tell him the truth that it's from man because the people will be mad at us. No, they actually contemplate, we can't say the truth. We can't say from heaven. I kind of think they knew it was from heaven. Yeah, it seems that way. Because the they know what Jesus is going to say in response. Why didn't you believe him then? Because they're intentionally not believing the truth. And this is the thing that I've really appreciated more and more in ministry, and I try to really push across Jesus is running around and people don't believe in him. Like, and we're surprised today when people reject him. You know what I mean? Like, seriously, he's literally right there. And they're still more willing to live in a lie than they are in the truth. How many times have you heard people say, uh, you know, if if Jesus really wanted us to believe in him or if God wanted us to show him his truth, he would just send him today. Like, if, if Jesus was here today, then I would believe him. Or, or if he did the miracles today in the presence of everybody, then more people would believe. Well, that might be kind of technically true, but your point is is very well taken. When he was on the earth, people didn't believe. So, you know, I, I kind of think of Jesus' own words, the Lazarus and the rich man, where he says, even if someone should rise from the dead, they won't believe. They have Moses and the prophets. Yeah. Listen to them. And so, yeah, I think that that is a very interesting thing. You have so many people who are willingly blinding themselves to the truth. I mean, Jesus is doing miracles. At the very least— they have to have believed that he was doing it somehow. I mean, yeah, they suggested demons, but Jesus kind of makes the good point of, well, why would demons be going around casting out demons? So then the only other answer is he's either faking it, which I don't think they believe, or it's from God. But then to deny that, yeah, it's just it's just an amazing kind of process of what they're thinking. 
Yeah. Well, you got to remember, too, when you're willing to live with a lie, you don't need things to rationally work in any way. You don't need to have them work well together. You can have that cognitive dissonance between the two things because everything about what they're doing is not about surrendering to the truth. It's about getting what they want. And how can we, this guy's attacking us, essentially, is what they're thinking, and he's a problem. And this, this is the tricky thing with the law, right? When you hear it preached, do you go, hey, maybe Jesus is right and I need to conform to it? Or do you just go, yeah, I think I got this, Jesus. Well, and speaking of relying on your own stuff, you know, he says, they said, we don't know, which I think is a lie. <laughs> I think they do know. But they say, we don't know because they don't want to answer the question. And Jesus says, well, neither will I tell you. Some people might look at this and go, well, Jesus is here to enlighten the world. He's here to teach the truth. He's here to reveal the truth. Don't they deserve an answer? And I think the answer to that question is no. They don't deserve an answer because they're only there with evil intentions. They're only there to trap Jesus. They're only there to get him to slip up or something. They don't deserve an answer. And and so what does that mean for us today? Well, we don't have to <laughs> we don't have to go to every battle that we're invited to. You know, when we, when we think about all the people out there who are questioning the beliefs of the church, not all of them are doing it trying to seek understanding. Mm-hmm. So when the world attacks us, we just the I think the example of Jesus here tells us that we just don't have to defend ourselves to everybody. And we certainly don't have to defend God. He doesn't need defense. Jesus was not compelled at all to correct them. He basically just said, I know what you're up to, and it's sort of a pearls before swine kind of thing. All right, well, let's move on to the next section. We're going to be moving into chapter 12 with the parable of the tenants. And Jesus began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, and dug a pit for the wine press, and built a tower, and leased it to tenants, and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He still sent, sorry, he had still one other, a beloved son. And finally, he sent him to them, saying, They'll respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him, and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Well, they were seeking to arrest him, but they feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him, and they went away. Well, they perceived rightly. (laughs) He was definitely speaking against them. This now is a super important text, I think, in today's context, because this is the truth that Jesus has taken the kingdom away from those to whom he had first given it to them because of their insolence, and he's given it to new people. Basically, he's saying, yes, he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yes, Israel and the Hebrews were the chosen people. And yes, the leadership of the Jews were called by God to be the leaders. But they killed the son. I mean, they haven't quite yet, but but he knows they will. And, and they've rejected Christ, which is the most important part. And so we as Christians are those people who have received the kingdom. We are the, we are the new Israel. But t- take us through this, because we actually preached on this not too long ago. I think it was from a different gospel. But yeah, take us through this. Yeah, so the thing that's always kind of stuck to me is the thing that they think they can kill the sun and they get the land. So this is actually, it's a cultural thing that's important about this. So we can get through this slowly. So we can get to that first. We can tackle that. So how it worked is if you don't have a harvest for three seasons to the people you're renting out the vineyard to, it means it's legally going to become theirs. So we already have had this. We're on the the last season where this the owner can actually get the land. And it's not a 
this is the important thing. The tenants are not there to just give him his fair share necessarily. Like this is an ownership battle that's going on. It's not just give me my money. It's this is my land or it's no, this is actually now our land, which plays really well into the, what the Pharisees are doing with Jesus just right above. So it's, it's a dispute of ownership. So you want to play with that. It's a dispute of ownership of the temple and Israel pretty easily is clearly what Jesus is getting after. Yeah, and just to interject, I think that's why it's really important that we understand verse twelve, chapter 12, verse 1. It says, and he began to speak to them in parables. The to them are the scribes and Pharisees, not his disciples. I mean, I'm sure they're around, but he's speaking. So understanding that who he's talking to helps us know what he's saying. But anyway, go ahead, please. Yeah. So this is why he sends the son. This is the guy you send, like, this is my last resort. He's going to come and he's going to kick these guys straight and they're going to listen to him. But that's the beauty of for their eyes too. Like, oh, the son showed up. Perfect. We kill this guy. This land is legally ours. We have taken it away from the landlord. So what else are they going to do? I mean, they're terrible tenants. They're wicked. What are they? The son shows up to go, hey, this is dad's. Give it back now. I mean, they know they're not keeping their job. So what do they do? Oh, we just kill the guy. It's ours. Problem solved. Dispute. Court case closed. It is now legally ours. So that's what actually makes Jesus' response really interesting. What does Jesus say? Well, of course, he's just going to go in and kill them all. Yep. That's not normal. That's not the legal procedure. So no. Jesus is going yeah. the completely, I mean, justice needs to be served, and that is what justice would take on. Well, and, and that's essentially what he's asking him is like, what, what do you think they w- the, the owner would do? I mean, you treat him so shamefully. It's, it reminds me of a little bit of a Nathan and da- uh, David situation where he gives him this parable and, you know, Ahata Harish, you are the man, you're the bad guy. Well, you know, I don't know that they immediately perceived that he was talking about them. So if they really were considering it, then they're like, well, I know what I would do if that happened to me. I'd go in and kill them all. Yeah. And Jesus says, yeah, you guys know what he would do. He'd kill them all. And then it's like, oh, oh, by the way, <laughs> you know, guess what's coming? And and that's, it's, it's not that Jesus doesn't, of course, love them and desire they come to the faith, but there is a reality that people harden their hearts against him. And, and I think this is important for us to remember as we have loved ones who we desperately want to come to the faith and we witness perhaps as much as we can, and, and not saying we should stop, but we should also recognize that in the end, there will be people who continue to harden their hearts, and there's really, you know, the Holy Spirit isn't, the, the grace is resistible, so it, the Holy Spirit isn't going to force them to believe, and so that's what's going on here, but that is a fascinating, you're right, people do get tripped up over the, does it make any sense to kill the heir to receive it? Well, culturally, it kind of did, but even if it didn't, it also illustrates that sin doesn't make sense, even yeah. if they weren't thinking clearly, because they weren't, because... If they kill the heir, of course they're going to get retaliated against. So they weren't even thinking clearly. And there's also an eternity aspect to this where the Pharisees, the scribes, they were looking at temporal power. uh, And yet in the grand scheme of things, what is that to have power for 50 years, 60 years? Uh, You know, Jesus is saying there's something greater here. And so he quotes scripture, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Um, interesting approach that he takes to this because he's also letting them know that all of this is happening as God foresaw that it would happen. Yeah, they're about to literally do the exact same thing he's preaching against in the parable, right? I mean, it's Holy Week. Jesus says they're going to kill the son as he's saying this. We're, what, got Wednesday, Thursday, three days away from them putting him up on a cross. These exact people. Yeah, I, it's just, it's it's fascinating to see this in light of what we know happens, and that is that he is the beloved son, and they don't respect him, and indeed, they think in their hearts that if they just get rid of this Jesus, then they'll stay in power. Um, what I think is interesting about that, though, is it suggests, and I'd like to hear what your thoughts are, but it suggests not that they were people who just didn't believe. Like, for instance, if we were in church and some guy were to bust in the back of the door in the middle of the sermon and say, I'm Jesus and I've come back, I said I would, we probably wouldn't even entertain that. Yeah. Uh, of course, Jesus has revealed to us the way in which he'll return, so that helps. But but still, it's like we would not entertain that. So sometimes, and, and I don't know, I don't want to be blasphemous, but sometimes I kind of feel bad for the Pharisees because I think, 
Well, that's that's the situation. It's just some guy, one of many, by the way. Lots of folks are out there claiming to be the Messiah throughout history. And so they're just thinking, well, this is just another one of those guys. But Jesus' words here, his illustration suggests that they actually believed he was the Messiah. Now, that puts a new spin on it. Maybe you disagree, but if they actually, if it's not just that they didn't believe, but rather they did believe but wanted to kill him so that they could remain in power, which is what this suggests, because in the parable, which he's relating to them, the tenants knew who he was. They knew uh, that he was the son. So if that's really about them, then that means the Pharisees actually believed but just literally was out to kill the Christ. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, but... I just wonder if there's something to that. Yeah, I think it, the Sadducees always seem interested in staying in their place of power, and the Pharisees always kind of seem like they should get along with Jesus and never quite do. I'm convinced of this with the disciples, too, with your point. Like, they think Jesus is the Messiah. They think he's a Messiah like Joshua and Moses. And this is what I think we miss. You've got to remember, he has the same name as Joshua. I mean, it's quite clear this guy is here to save us. And normally, historically, you save people from the sins by kicking out the current guy occupying the power, and you can restore reign. So if that's what they're thinking, I mean, it's kind of like, uh, hey, Jesus, like, it's, you know, our holiest festival is coming up, and the Romans are still here. Like, what are you doing, dude? Like, get on it. Start getting rid of these guys. Sure. And that'll be important a little bit in the next part of the text. But I'm I'm convinced that some of it is, they want to get along with Jesus, and Jesus isn't doing what he should be doing in their eyes. Now, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, when we talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, in the context of their day, this is a little complicated, but the Pharisees were a little more liberal than the ultra-conservative Sadducees. And you might think, well, what does that mean? Well, the Sadducees basically were um, so conservative that they didn't think that anything beyond the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were Scripture. So they thought that the Pharisees were liberal in allowing all the other prophecies to be in. Now, in today's day and age, we would actually probably call the Pharisees conservative and the Sadducees liberal in the sense that the Pharisees were very keen on preserving the rituals of the church, preserving the traditions, and frankly, preserving the scriptures. And the Sadducees really abandoned a lot of what we consider the scriptures. Now, why do I say any of this? Well, the Pharisees are kind of the good guys in many ways because they genuinely want to follow God's will. With that said, though, it doesn't mean that they hadn't succumbed to sin. I think of Herod uh, when Jesus was born. Herod didn't say, I'm going to go and kill this child so that people don't accidentally follow a false prophet. Mm -hmm. He believed that he was the Messiah. Herod believed that this child was fulfilling prophecy. He went to his people and said, hey, where's the Messiah going to be born? And they said, oh, well, Bethlehem. All right, go kill all the kids in Bethlehem. So he believed in the Messiah and wanted to destroy him. So I don't think it's a big leap to say that some of these Pharisees and Sadducees and others, it's not that they just didn't believe or didn't understand. They actually did believe. And as you were saying very appropriately, and he's not acting like what we think he should be acting like. I think of Judas. Did Judas believe Jesus was the Messiah? I think so. But Judas, aside from being inhabited by Satan, was thrown off with the reality that he's just not being Joshua. He's yeah. not doing what he's supposed to do. Yeah, I'm I'm thoroughly convinced. There's no textual evidence of this, but I am thoroughly convinced Judas was the most passionate of the disciples. Like if I was making a TV show based on this, I would make Judas the most likable disciple. Because I think he really thinks when he goes and does this to Jesus, he honestly thinks, in my, from my reading of the scriptures, he's helping Jesus. Like, Jesus, you're supposed to be doing this, dude. Like, you are here to save us, so save us. I mean, think about how passionate you get about politics, right? And especially think if you're occupied, you've been occupied for ages, and the guy comes who is quite literally the Savior. He's the guy who's going to save you, and to be a little crass. He's kind of just farting around. Right. Yeah, from from their their from their, point from their of view. perspective, yeah. Well, I, you know what, uh, and I certainly wouldn't preach from this, but you know what, what makes a good illustration of how I really think Judas was, and that is the musical Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, first of all, I just love that. Okay, I just love the. the I, it was very controversial when it came out. People thought it was disrespectful. I, I don't know. I guess we could debate that. But the Judas character in that was someone who wanted to see God's plan come to fruition. And I almost compare him a little bit to Sarah, who believed in the promise but wanted to make it happen in her own way. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that Judas like gets off the hook for his betrayal. It doesn't mean any of that. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm not painting Judas in a good light just trying to whatever. I just really do think that it was a lot about him not understanding, and I think I think you're right. I think he really thought that he was helping the cause. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of this is and why there's so much engagement with Jesus with these groups because they're like, come on, man, go go be the guy that we want you to be. We don't need... We, and, and this is the problem today we preach against, I'm thoroughly convinced, is the Jesus, you need to conform to what I want you to be. I am not going to conform to you. I can't believe in a God who would blank, or yeah. I can't believe in a God who wouldn't blank. Yeah, because you think the first commandment's about you. <laughs> right. Now, it's that, now, that is a huge struggle, too, because, and as we talked about when we talked about the, you know, the turning over the tables, Jesus is hard to pin down if we're trying to understand him based on who we think God should be. Mm. Instead of just submitting to the fact that God's going to reveal as much as he wants us to know, there's still a ton of things that he that we don't know, which I think that's another problem, too. We try to fill in the details. Mm. But nope, God lets us know exactly what we need to know. Well, we're going to finish up this section when we come back from our break, and then we'll move into a section where they try to entrap him by asking him about paying taxes. Should be a good conversation, folks. We will see you when we come back. Uh, don't go anywhere. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back, dear listeners. I'm Pastor Phil Boo, your host, and this is Thy Strong Word. With me this morning is the Reverend Jesse Baker. He's the pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Hardwick, Minnesota. Right now, we've moved into the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to finish that up in just here a minute. But I want to say, before we head back into the text, if you have any feedback or questions or comments, feel free to reach out. You can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R. B-O-O-E at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook. Just search for Phil Boo. You'll recognize me. And you can send me messages there. Like, friend, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Do all that. But I tell you what, let's get back into the text because that's why you're here. Um, we, brother, were last time we were together uh, before the break, <laughs> we were talking about uh, the fact that the inheritance is eternal life. The inheritance is a, a lifetime in peace with God. The inheritance is Eden restored. It's so interesting that when he uses this to compare to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, he, he's, he's saying they think they're going to get the inheritance because they killed the son. But there's some irony there, isn't there? Yeah. Because doesn't the inheritance come to all people because of the sacrifice of the son? Uh, it's, it's a little ironic, but then of course, uh, woe to him by whom the temptation, or in this case, the sacrifice comes. You know, just and that kind of feeds into our conversation about Judas because I've heard some people say, now I don't really go this far with Judas, but some people say Judas, knowing the Messiah needed to be sacrificed, kind of hastened it. And I, I, I think that's pretty, I, I, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> we'll get to heaven and I'll go, oh, that's exactly what it was. I, I don't think so exactly. No, especially with the apostles writing Satan entered him <laughs> right. and then the whole thing I, it's an axe right where it says Judas bowels burst from his stomach you don't write that 
lovingly. Like I have fond memories of this guy. And by the way, when he died, it was really gross. Like <laughs> yeah. those don't go together. Exactly. But what we do know is that God can use even the wickedness of man for his own purposes. But there is this great irony that the tenants say, let's kill the heir so the inheritance will be ours. But as it plays out in real life, they kill the heir and the inheritance ends up being taken away. Yeah. And everybody else's. Yeah. So he quotes from the scriptures, the stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. That's from, uh, let's see here, Psalms 118, uh, 22 and 23. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Well, there's a couple things that stand out to me. One, the concept of a cornerstone. And two, he includes the quote, it was the Lord's doing. I think there's some hints in that, if not outright prophecy, that even though they're the, going to be the ones that sacrifice the Christ, the Lord is the one who is sacrificing his son. God, Yahweh, is the one who is sacrificing his son for our benefit. So they're rejecting the cornerstone. It's their sin, but God's working through it. It's kind of amazing. But let's talk about that cornerstone a little bit. Cornerstones are the, from what I understand, feel free to write in, folks, if uh, you have a better understanding, but cornerstones especially in ancient times, were like the first block that had to be perfectly level and plumb and straight because it was the one that you would then build off of for the rest of your your structure. Today, cornerstones are often, and maybe they are still used, I don't know, I'm not a mason, but but they, they're they often like the, the one where you engrave the, the date that the yeah. church had. Yeah. So it's like an honorary thing. But back then, the cornerstone was something important. It was that upon which you had to build the whole building. How does that relate to Jesus? Yeah, so, I mean, there's some amusement in this, but think about it, like, for all you people who either own a house, rent, or whatever, you work in a building, more than likely, you pour a bad foundation, it's going to become really evident really quick. I mean, you need that to be the best, the safest part of the house, essentially. Otherwise, it's going to shift, it's going to crack, and then you're going to have a whole bunch of structural issues and the whole house is going to come crumbling down at some point. And that's kind of the point. But think about the imagery of this, right? you got a bunch of builders. They're professionals. They're, you know, big burly guys, right? And they've been doing this for a long time and they know what to look for. You'd think they know what to look for in a cornerstone, right? Like this is clearly the best one. And what do they do? They find the perfect cornerstone line. And this should be like, oh my goodness, we could build the most beautiful thing with this cornerstone. What do they do? They go find the one that has a crack and a hole in it. Like, this is good enough, guys. We found it. That's right. Yeah, that's a little nepotism, right? They're not going to get that perfect one. They're going to get Uncle Billy Bob there. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, Jesus comes and, and, and we see this time and again, but I think even Jesus gets, you know, a little, uh, aghast at people's lack of faith. We see that often. He comes, he fulfills prophecy, and he goes to people who are the professionals. They should know prophecy, and they should say, this fits perfect, but we've already built our building on this cracked one from Billy Bob. And so we, we would have to actually tear the building down because we've built it up on ourselves and our own works and our own laws It's a lot of work to tear it down. And plus, we'd have to admit that we didn't do a good job. Yeah. I don't want to surrender. And that's us too. How many times do we think, I need to be this super good person. I need to rely on my own works or or even my own virtues. And that's big today too. People, they don't even rely on their work so much as they think that just by means of their own good opinions, they're going to be saved. Yeah. You know, I'm an ally. I am, (laughs) I am woke. I am... Well, um, we all know Jesus would have been in this certain party that I belong to politically. <laughs> right, yeah. No matter which political party you fill that in with, of course Jesus would be that. Right, and so they think, well, I just have the right opinions. And I'm going to be honest with you folks, no one is saved by their perfect doctrine either. So even though I certainly believe that the Lutheran confessions are as close as we get to perfect doctrine this side of Christ's return, nobody's going to be saved just for confessing those. People are saved for building their faith upon the cornerstone, which is Jesus. And that's essentially what the, pro- the prophets were saying, uh, the psalmist was saying. This is what Jesus is saying, and um, the Lord is going to use that. But yeah, they reject the good thing because they basically don't want to have to admit that they've built up a religion on themselves.
All right. Well, let's move on to the next section because, as you said earlier, this kind of feeds into what happens next, or at least in the environment, because in verse 13 it says, And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by opinions, but truly teach the true way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? I actually want to pause there. I mean, we all know what he says, but I'm going to pause there. I got to tell you, they send the Pharisees, and we've talked about the Pharisees. We should talk a little bit about the Herodians. The Herodians were, they, well, they obviously supported Herod. That's the Herodian part. But they liked the Romans too. You know, yeah. they, they were happy with, they were happy to report Jesus to the Roman authorities. They were happy to play ball. I think they saw, as Herod did, the source of their power and authority in the in the, in the Roman Romans. occupation. Yeah. yeah, well, and that's the whole point. Like, think they're under Herod. Herod's put there by Rome. This isn't, they don't only play games here. So their allegiance ultimately is to Rome. They're the guys keeping order, keeping everything moving, and... Rome is not exactly the oppressor you want to fight back against. They are not, I mean, I'm going to put this really nicely. They do not mess around. They will put you in their perceived place, and they're not going to be gentle about it. So this is, this is the funny thing about this text. The Pharisees are the exact extreme polar opposite of this. I mean, we're talking, we are pro-Israel, kick the Romans out, we hate them. And we need to restore the temple as it properly should be again. And maybe even get rid of that temple and build a new one because the dirty Romans built that one. Like, they're, they're right. exact. So, I mean, this is essentially, you got your communists hanging out with, I don't know, your <laughs> libertarians or your uh, anarchists. And they're like, right. you know, we both hate this guy so much. We're going to get together and do this, which is completely laughable. Well, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were two opposing parties. The Herodians are like a third party. They always fight with each other, but they find a common enemy in Jesus. And so, as, as you said, they're going to trap him in his talk, and they're going to do it. And, and I, what I think is fascinating about this is there's a cowardice here because they're going to trap him in the talk. The talk is about taxes. Well, who's going to be upset about taxes? Pharisees? Sadducees? Herodians? No. Romans. So they're really trying to get the government involved involved yeah. to do their their bidding. Um, it reminds me a little bit ooh, of when we were in the midst of COVID. I was still in Connecticut. And I, as a circuit visitor, um, I'd heard word from some of the other fellow pastors that we had parishioners calling the authorities on their own congregations for having church. So that they would come and shut it down. That's wild. Yeah. I, and now I could go into deep, deeper detail. Obviously, I won't out of respect for people's privacy. But this is a reality that there were – this is the same thing. It's like people in the midst saying, I'm going to get the government involved because things aren't going the way I want them to. Hmm. They say, let's get the government involved because that way – well, what's he going to do? Resist all of Rome? <laughs> and, and so they asked this about paying taxes. He says, teacher – and I love the – all the flattery. <laughs> Rabbi, now we know that you are true and you don't care about anyone's opinion. And it's sort of like, well, what tipped you off when I was flipping over the tables? <laughs> yeah. Or when I was whipping the money changers? But but funny enough is they're flattering him with truth. He doesn't care about people's opinions mm -hmm. in the sense that he's not going to, you know, cower behind, you know, a lie just because someone doesn't like it. But he says, for you are not swayed by appearances, you true. They're laying it on thick. You mm. truly teach the way of God. They're wanting him to obviously trip up and say something wrong, but I think it's interesting that they are so oblivious to Jesus' wisdom and his, you know, his uh, ability to know what they're thinking. They really think he's going to fall for this. I guess that's what I'm trying to yeah. say. That seems... The Awful. This is like the funniest part of the gospel, in my opinion. It needs, I can't think of the name of the song, but you know the song that they always play before something really ridiculous, like in a Charlie Chaplin movie or something's about to go down? Oh, the like that Keystone Cops song? Or yeah, is that what you're talking about? that like, needs to be played when this is going on, because <laughs> it is the most comical thing ever. Like, their questions just even, 
re- the whole thing is played out. Jesus, they're going to trap Jesus, and all Jesus does in this is trap them, essentially, in all honesty. It is just a comedy if you know enough of the culture background, what's going on here. Because you got to remember, so you're in the temple right now, and we're going to get to it when, when you need a denarius, but it is just hysterical what happens. Well, let's look at what happens then, going into 15. But knowing their hypocrisy, of course, he's Jesus, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius. Let me look at it. And they brought him one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And then Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. I always imagine him at that moment just flipping the coin (laughs) coin back back, at them. (laughs) Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Take it back. Um, First of all, we've heard this so often. I do think the punch has been lost. I'll just be honest. But putting ourselves back in that time, trying to hear it anew. And I know this sounds kind of silly because he's Jesus, but man, Jesus is brilliant. Yeah, it's such a good way to handle it. I mean, he he really, he, he, he also reveals in these words something really deep. And that is not just about paying taxes, but he reveals to us that there are things that are God's and there are things that are Caesar's. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, all things are God's. So that makes it pretty easy. But he also lets us know, though, that because there are some things that belong to Caesar, there are things that we have to render because it's just how God has set up the world. Yeah. At the same time, by, you know, the, the binary opposite, there are things that don't belong to Caesar. Mm-hmm. And that's really important, too. Now, knowing the difference, that's where wisdom and being in the Bible comes in. But anyway, go back to the top. Why put me to the test? He knows they're doing it. He yeah. says, bring me a denarius. Bring me a denarius. This is, this is the amusing part of this whole thing. So you need to know a little bit about ancient coinage. So in thinking of this, the ruler's image doesn't just guarantee it, but it belongs to that ruler. And you need to remember... On Sunday, Jesus flips over the money changers. In the temple, you can't be walking around with a graven image. I mean, Caesars think he's a god. And there are really pious Jews, probably the Pharisees, and this is something I found interesting, that they wouldn't even look at the coinage because it's a graven image. So you got this Herodian going, oh, Jesus, I have a denarius. It's like, that dude, that's not even supposed to be in here. What are you oh. doing? I've never thought that's of that. not allowed in the temple. And this guy just <laughs> whips one out like it's totally normal and fine. I mean, think of the Pharisees just look like, what are you doing, dude? Like that's almost like akin to blasphemy. Well, and it also reveals loyalties. Yeah. I mean, they're not following the law, at least the Herodians, right? They're not following the law. Wow. No, that's interesting. I never really thought about that. I mean, I knew the purposes of the money changers and everything else, but. Yeah, I've never really thought about it in that context. So, yeah, they, he just pulls out a, a coin, which is, and, he's, and he says, why do you bring me a denarius? <laughs> I also like that because he um, he knows they have it. Yeah. I mean, that's a day's wages. It's a lot of money. It's not, yeah, it's not insignificant. And that's the part about it I love. That's why I think it needs to be a comedy track because everything's falling apart right now. Once Jesus says, bring me that coinage that's, in your guys' opinion, graven image, and I, I'm even going to look at it, guys. Like, this isn't just a oh, look at this nice, crisp $100 bill. It's like, I'm going to stare at this thing you guys think is offensive. <laughs> he says to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And, of course, I'm looking at a picture of one. You can Google one. Um, but, yeah, it has obviously a, a stamp of the picture of Caesar. And, and you, you bring up a really important point, too, that Caesar considers himself, uh, you know, a god king, a god emperor. Mm-hmm. He considers himself a god. Yeah. And so it ends up being a division between, you know, do you understand that there are some things that are of this world that Jesus, frankly, is just not that concerned with? I, I think another thing that we're hearing is that, what is this, a coin? What is this, a day's wages? I, yeah, here, Caesar can have it. That's, yeah. It's just not important. That's mm-hmm. just not what's important. Why are you guys worried about things like who to pay taxes to? When there's so many more important things to worry about. Yeah, just pay them. I always say this, pay your taxes and pay them better and more faithfully than everyone else. Yeah. Like, who cares? That is that is your responsibility as a Christian. And that's yep. kind of his point. Like, guys, there are a lot more important things in the world than the things that bear the image of Caesar. Right, right. 
And so some things proverbially bear the image of Caesar and some things don't. So we know we ran into that. I brought up COVID earlier. It's kind of like a four letter word. It's hard to bring it up anymore. <laughs> but, but you know, we struggled during that time, I think for the first time in a lot of people's lives of what can Caesar do fully require of us and what things should we resist? And mm-hmm. in some cases it's different for everybody, but in some cases it's very clear cut. So for instance, Caesar does not have his inscription or image upon things like the divine service, the gifts of God, the means of grace, prayer, those kinds of things. And therefore, he has absolutely no authority to limit them in any way. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing that really hits, especially us as pastors, depending how we handled it. And most of us, unfortunately, did close. But think about what happened with Daniel. This this is an example we should have been following. They passed the law. Daniel, you can't pray anymore. What does Daniel do? Yeah, good for you. I'm going to do it anyways because I don't care what you guys have to say. Because this is the reality that I've really found interesting lately. There are worse consequences out in life than death and punishment from the government. It's called losing our faith. That is far more serious. And I think as Christians, it's something we need to hold on to far better than what we have. Well, Jesus says, Jesus says, I'll have to think about where it was, but, but basically, you know, be more concerned about not the one who can harm the body, but the one that can destroy the body and soul in hell. You know, he says, what's the worst they can do to you? Kill you? Yeah, big deal. I'm already victorious over death. Yeah. You already have received eternal life. The worst they could do is kill you. And I've said that to people before. <laughs> you know, the worst that could happen is you would die. Yeah. What? What? Well, yeah, yeah but but then you're with Jesus. And we certainly, we certainly shouldn't hasten the beautiful gift of life that God has given us. But at the same time... You know, it, it, we have to face the consequences. And now that brings up another point. When we obey God rather than man in these situations where Caesar is demanding something that doesn't belong to him, it doesn't mean that we're completely freed from the temporal consequences of that. Okay, yeah. So he may say, well, now you're not allowed to do communion. Can't do communion. I don't like it for some reason. You know, some big government says that. I don't know how that would ever come to be. Let's just say it. Well, you do not only cannot submit to that, you absolutely should not submit to that. But then he says, well, if you do it and I catch you, you're going to jail. Well, you might end up in jail. Guess we're in a jail, yeah. The apostles do it and they're singing in jail. They love it. (laughs) Right, and people come to faith through their presence in jail. And I think that's the thing where it gets so, it gets harder when the rubber actually meets the road, right? Right. Of Is the government actually overstepping bounds here? And this this isn't something you can hash out normally in a day. And this is where it gets real sticky, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just... Go, oh, obviously, more often than not, it's not just, hey, no communion, guys. Like, oh, okay, good, cool. We'll end up in prison over this. It's worth it. Like, we can't, <laughs> we can't not, it's not do that. that. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. It's not that clear. And it's a little, you know, I, I always try to think of the easiest example to explain, but it does get a lot more detailed when, you know, especially you have division within the own, with your, within the own household of God about, you know, is this something that Caesar can ask for? I think taxes was an interesting tactic for them to use because nobody likes paying taxes. (laughs) Not a Uh, new thing, yeah. Right. So I think that they were also hedging their bets because if he would have said, well, yes, of course it's lawful to pay taxes. Well, the indigent, poor, oppressed people that were following him, I'm sure they thought, well, maybe they'll get mad at him. Yeah. Exactly. They thought they got him. Yeah, or if he were to say, no, don't worry about paying taxes, well, then we got the Romans against him. Go get him arrested. So in some ways, their question is really clever. It's just Jesus is smarter than them. Yeah. Uh, So why do you put me to the test? He says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, to God the things that are God's. Um, Let's talk about the things that are God's. Mm -hmm. You know, in Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Well, we are made in the image of God. We are, of course, we, we fell into sin. We have original sin, but we are redeemed from that, brought into a new life with God, uh, both upon your heart and upon your forehead. You get the mark of God. The image of God is inscribed on us. Mm-hmm. Therefore, we belong to God. Yeah. Uh, just as the, all the coinage belongs to Caesar, he can have it because our kingdom is not of this world. I think that's another thing that we should probably take away from this. Absolutely, yeah. And that's the point. Like uh, The beings bearing the image of God belong to God. It's just like the, the coin of the image. This is Caesar's because his image is on it. Just as you've been baptized and you bear the image of God, you belong to him. 
And there's a lot of consequences of that that matter. If you're God's, then these last couple of parables should be really hitting you in the face and going, oh, am I acting like I'm God's? Well, well, you know, I think when we look at the coinage too, the co- and I just sort of saw this in the notes here, the Latin inscription on the coin is Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And then on the back, he calls himself Pontific, Pontifex Maximus. So Caesar claims to be both the head of the state and the head of religion or head of Mm -hmm. worship. And, of course, Jesus grants him the first claim. Sure, you can be whatever. Second claim, though, he reserves for himself. So that image on the coinage uh, points us, as you've been pointing out, the image that we receive, that we belong to Christ. And if we belong to Christ, if we, you know, we have to live in a way (laughs) that he wants us to live. He so many people are perfectly satisfied with Jesus being the one who dies for them. And yet they don't necessarily want to receive his gifts. And they certainly don't necessarily want to live in his ways. Now I know that's something we all struggle with, but we have to be very careful because let's think about this. When it comes between the things that are Caesar's and God's, let's expand Caesar, not just to government, but just things of the world. How often do people choose the things of the world over the things of God? Yeah. You know, it's not that sports is a big one, work, family can even be a God to people. And so Jesus is saying that as much as this is a text about paying your taxes, it's much more a text about some things just belong to God and you need to render those things to him too. Yeah, and that you need to submit to that reality. You can't you can't wrestle those things away from God. And that that's the hard thing. I always go, to, this is my big thing, I always go to Job, right? Job's lying in the ditch essentially and God finally comes up and he goes hey God what in the world why'd you do this to me and we get the most beautiful words ever because I'm God yeah where were you yeah where were dude you're a creature yeah I am the creator I owe you nothing and I think we don't like that about God that God owes us nothing he is God he is not just Zeus he is not a human he is God right you don't approach that The fact that God approaches us is utterly baffling. That's the beauty of it. But you don't get to go to him. It's just like in the ancient times, Jesus couldn't say, you know what, I'm going to have an audience with Caesar. Right. No, that's not going to happen. Like some lowly backwater place in the Roman Empire, you don't get to just meet Caesar. That is like child's play in comparison to us and God. And I think we often, and this is why the first commandment is everything, we often lose sight of that. Unfortunately, that, I mean, the famous phrase we hear at Summoner, God is God and you are not. Right. And right. thank God that you're not God because you'd be really lousy at it. Well, we absolutely have domesticated God. We, we've taken God and we've removed from him, at least in the way that we treat him, his omnipotence, his glory, his, you know, we treat him like a little pocket superhero. We just pull him out <laughs> when we need him. Um, and it, that it is a blasphemy against God. Absolutely. Now, it's true that God has condescended to us in the person of Jesus, as you said. He's come down to us. That's amazing. But we must never forget that he is God and we are not. So, well, I tell you what, that we that's pretty much the end of our program for today. But I do want to thank the Reverend Jesse Baker, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Hardwick, Minnesota, for joining me this morning. Brother, I look forward to having you back on the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Okay, folks. Well, tomorrow we're going to finish up our week by finishing up chapter 12. In chapter 12, uh, for the rest of it anyway, we're going to hear the Sadducees ask about the resurrection. Then Jesus is going to give us the greatest commandment, and we're going to hear about Jesus and his reality of, I'm sorry, the reality of him being the Son of God, that he is the Christ and the widow's offering and all kinds of other things. So join us for that tomorrow as we finish up our week. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.